All right, and welcome to the Dan Go cast over here. And I have my friend Dan Co with us. <laughs> so Dan Co and Dan Go, we we meet again. Yes. And uh, something I want to say about uh, Dan Co and something that I've noticed about you is that uh, you are actually one of the most uh, introspective guys that I've met on social media. Um, a lot of your content that you come out with uh, is very well thought out. It's actually more so based off of your own story. It's based off of the things, obviously, that you read. Uh, but you are a guy that actually has like an immense amount of self-awareness, which is something that I totally respect. Now, I want to start off this interview by asking you, what does walking mean to you, my friend? <laughs> it means a lot. That And <clears throat> so the... The whole walk thing, I'm, I'm curious as to how it caught on in the first place. It's so weird. Like, it, it's it's a weird feeling that I haven't been able to, like, talk about or even, like, want to talk about because it's power. Where, like, I, I, I say go on a walk and people start going on a walk. It's the weirdest thing. And I don't know if I should even have that power. But that's why I say go on a walk because it's a generally good thing to do. But the in terms of actually going on a walk, I used to hate going on a walk, man. Yeah. Like when I was, th this could go tie into a whole nother story. But when I was living with my ex, I think we were connected around this time when I was considering going to Mexico. It was during that time where like I was just lost, like in the weeds. And she would always go on a walk and she'd invite me to go on a walk. And I would go sometimes, but I just hate it. Like there was no purpose behind going on the walk to me. It's like, I'm just walking, I'm wasting time. I could be home, like on my computer doing this other stuff. And th that th the shift didn't really happen until I came back from Mexico and was like, okay, it's time to get on my shit. Like I have to get something done. I'm like 20 pounds heavier than I've ever been. And I, I don't like cardio. So the only option is to go on a walk. And so I kind of set the goal for myself to just go on a walk after every meal. And I know that has other benefits, but to me, that was kind of like a challenge, right? And me dissecting this now and understanding the thought process that went behind me starting to enjoy walks is that I gamified it. I would have some form of purpose that wasn't even health related. It was kind of health related, but my purpose for going on a walk started as, okay, I'm doing this. So I get more steps in, I'm more active. And then it's like, wow, I'm having some great ideas on these walks and I can't stop writing notes down on my phone. And then it's like, then it turned into kind of a listening meditation where I'm listening to audiobooks and taking notes at the same time. And then it got to the point where it's like, I, I, I know the importance of getting daily sunlight. So, and I, I don't want to go and just lay out by the pool. That kind of sounds boring to me. So I'm going to walk behind my apartment complex with my shirt off. And now I'm doing two in one or like four in one where I'm getting my daily sunlight. I'm getting a tan. I'm uh, like learning new things. I'm taking notes and it, like all around it just became like a very good and kind of foundational practice in my life that spread into everything like what I talk about on social media spread into me just learning and being able to understand things that I've never been able to understand before and moving more, uh, reaping the energy benefits from that and being able to eat more. Like there's so many benefits that I didn't realize before just because my mind was closed off to it. And I was thinking of different things. It's like, why am I on a walk previously with my girlfriend? It's like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Instead of like, what is this doing for me that I am not noticing right now what has been one of your biggest realizations while going on walks <laughs> uh some heavy shit man yeah. like i'm deep into the like one of my favorite things to study is consciousness and and like metaphysics and just like what is all of this right and so i've had some pretty profound realizations on these walks where it's like i'm listening to these lectures on like god realization and all these other things and it, it, it takes a bit right this is one thing i missed as a kid is i would read 
books and I wouldn't understand them at all. But then five years later, I, I understand it because like the, the piece of advice that like hits you, it makes you remember that. And you're like, oh, that's what they meant. And that wouldn't have happened if I didn't read the book. So this is one reason why I'm big on just like studying and reading and at least like trying to understand things because you will understand them eventually, even if it's 10 years down the road. And so I, I can't, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a good realization without sounding like a crazy person. Uh, Please sound like a crazy person. Please. Well, I'm still trying to piece it together too <laughs> as to, oh, okay, so the, the most recent realization is that everything is a figment of consciousness. Like it, it's not, it's not atoms, it's not molecules, it's not uh, other things. And if you've, if you know who Ken Wilber is and his whole holonic theory where everything is a whole and a part and a whole in itself, it, it's a holon. So what that means is like, um, man, I'm still not good at explaining this, but I know that me trying to explain it will help me explain it better is let's say, let, let's take an atom, right? An atom is a whole and a part, a molecule, like it is a part of a molecule and that molecule is also a whole and then moving up to like a cell and then other things like it expands in infinite directions, mm -hmm. but, oh man, I can't even this took like a three hour lecture for me to understand. So it'd be hard to <laughs> explain, but I would say, okay. So a realization that I can't explain is that n knowledge in general is a very useful thing to pursue and try to develop. I think that, uh, as humans, the, the only thing that differentiates us from other beings is our mind is like our cognitive capacity. And I think that is some form of a sign that we need to develop that to a point where we are advancing. That's how we as humans advance society as a whole, where uh, we are able to come up with ideas and solutions and other things based on our knowledge in order to open up room for more ideas and solutions and just advancing things. That's where everything comes from. The idea of let's say a plow opened up the possibility of the idea of like a, a machine that plows the field and so on and so forth. So like AI couldn't have been a thing if the idea for the computer wasn't a thing. And so in order to get to that point, it took a good amount of intellectual development to get there. So in my eyes and why I do what I do is that I think at least like the future of work is going to depend on individuals or thought leaders as cringe as that word is. It's going to depend on people's intellectual development to come up with the ideas that will lead to us being able to do what we want with our time and like lean into our curiosity, our passion, our purpose and do that full time. And I think that's what tech is helping us do is kind of free up the work that we don't want to do. So we are able to be more creative and entertain each other and do all of these things that will help us focus more on intellectual and cognitive de development. I feel like we're, we're getting away. Obviously, if we look at kind of history, we're getting away from the manual labor of, uh, of work, of uh, showing up to work every day, uh, mm -hmm. doing something physical, and moving towards things that actually use our brains and more creativity. So it's kind of like this like stepladder. So we've gotten away from uh, literally plowing our fields to having a machine uh, operated by a human to plow the field. Then eventually AI is going to plow that field. And then what is it left for humans to do at that point? Uh, it's left for us to actually come up with new ideas uh, for exactly. new ways of doing things and to actually use our brains, which are the most efficient and most powerful uh, computers on the planet uh, in order to surpass the physical nature of, of human beings, right? But that doesn't mean getting away from walking. <laughs> it's so <laughs> weird, you know, because 
It's like we're turning into all these like intellectuals, but at the same time, we need our physical body and we need to do physical things with our bodies in order to actually be smarter, in order to have uh, less anxiety, in order to be able to control our minds in the first place. And one of the things that I found about you uh, that I've actually seen over the course of, I would say the last two years since I've known you, is uh, you've literally went from being this pale, pasty, somewhat <laughs> skinny guy, uh, maybe skinny fat to a degree, and then you literally turned into one of the most jacked beasts in the span of like six months. So one thing I want to ask you is, is one, what the fuck happened uh, with that? <laughs> what caused this transformation in the first place? And I want to know what happened in Mexico as well, because you came back from Mexico and you're just like, well, this is not working for me. I need to do something else. So, you know, let's start with the body transformation. What was the catalyst for that? Uh, because I know that you're always into fitness, but then you got yourself out of it. Uh, what was the catalyst for you getting your body uh, into the most ridiculous shape that it's ever been? Yeah. So I think this is good to to preface and and stress the importance of lighting. Lighting and a tan <laughs> can do a lot for a person. Yes. A lot. Yes. So, but yeah, I, I've been training since I was like 15. It's always been a passion of mine. And the turning point was like I've gone through these cycles as well like I'm not a fan of bulking anymore uh, because it, it's always led to me at a certain point just letting go of myself it's like okay I've lost like whatever abs I have I'm like pale why not just lean into this and not really care about how I eat and then that turns into uh, like a two three months self-destructive cycle and that's what happened when I was living with uh, my ex at the time is that we broke up. I was still in that, like I, I didn't move out. We were still in a lease together. And so I was sleeping on the floor. Were you in... still working out while you were with your ex? Like This was you... during COVID. That That's okay. a crucial thing. Okay. The, the gyms closed. I had a park down the street, but just again, didn't want to walk. It was too hot. Didn't want to go out there, whatever excuses. Mm -hmm. And so... I was just ordering Uber Eats, eating huge Chipotle burritos every day, uh, eating like salad and go, breakfast burritos, whatever I could get my hands on. And that like was just convenient. And so I gained maybe 30 pounds heavier than I am now. Mm -hmm. And then decided like when I saw the opportunity to actually go to Mexico, that's when things started to click. It's like, oh. Like I could actually do this. I could actually get out of this lease fairly early and like make this drastic change. And so this is also why I'm very big on vision is like if you can imagine yourself feeling high energy in this environment that is very positive and also has a lot of energy and um, like you, you have the clarity on how you're actually going to get there. I had the previous experience of cutting weight, eating, like I have a very, I have a decent knowledge of nutrition and fitness in general. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is exactly what I need to do. It just made sense. It was like that burst of clarity that it's like the change happens now. And so like two weeks leading up to leaving to Mexico, that's when I started going to the park. That's when I started like doing pull-ups on the, uh, on the gym. park thing like you, yeah you could create a whole like fitness transformation montage out of it and <laughs> like the then i went montage. to yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and so ended up going to mexico the gyms were closed there yeah. and so that kind of pissed me off but at this point i was like going to the beach starting to get some sun feeling a lot better uh, food choices were limited so i was eating a lot better as well um and then there, the, the thing that su sucked is that I, I couldn't take Zoom calls or calls of any kind. And I was doing client work during this time. Uh, couldn't take Zoom calls of any kind because the Wi-Fi sucked. And so there I was, I made the, I had the realization that one, I thrive on routines and uh, having a home base, like just having somewhere where I have all of my stuff, right? And so I ended up leaving Mexico earlier because of the Wi-Fi and 
just knowing that I should probably have a home base in the States. Like I, I, I didn't want to be a nomad that was just like floating around. It didn't really appeal to me. And so got back home and moved into a decent, like a, a, an apartment that I wouldn't have been able to afford before. And we could talk about like my notion of tactical stress in a bit, but mm. that's, that's where the catalyst really kicked into place because it's like, okay, I have my routine. I have a new place. I have my gym. I have everything in place. Uh, the, the modern mastery was born at that time. It's like everything was going well. I met a new girl. Everything was perfect. And so I just milk that for six months and was out in the sun all the time walking just on routine. And that's where the transformation came from really. Mm -hmm. And then now I've just maintained, been maintaining up until that point because like I've, I've, felt myself wanting to go back into that cycle of like, just stop caring about this stuff. You're not cutting, you're not bulking. You don't have per se a health goal right now that you can focus your attention towards. So it's like, it's very different for me right now. It's just a matter of like making that habit. I, I think you're doing it the right, actually, I know you're doing it the right way because results don't lie, right? But it feels to me that even, especially if you don't necessarily have a goal, you're really doing it for the process in and of itself, right? right. You're not, you're doing it because you are actually doing it for the sake of almost like doing it because it actually makes you a, uh, it actually gives you peace. You know, it actually makes you feel good. You're not doing it to even look a certain way, even though your body has changed. You're doing it for the process, for the process's sake, right? And, th and I think that's like what people have to get away from a lot when it comes to fitness uh they're very much like I, I gotta lose this weight or i gotta like you know you know bulk up and gain all this muscle and they're really trying to like break down their goals into like 12 week to 16 week spans when the reality is is that this whole fitness thing and the the even process of changing it actually happens in the course of years rather than the course of weeks uh so i really i mean like i really am down with that because I feel like even for me, I'm not trying to fucking like lift double two and a half times my body weight anymore. I'm not trying to fucking, you know, you know, bench press, you know, a certain amount of weight. I'm actually more focused on going to the gym, making sure I show up there consistently and just getting just like a slightly a little bit better because that's that's what gets me. You know, that's what makes mm -hmm. me feel great. Just if I do something a little bit more than I did before. Right now. You actually mentioned something which was very interesting, and I don't necessarily know if you mean it in this way, but you said something in the regards to uh, tactical stress. So I have yes. this thing where you you make an investment, and, or it could be an investment, it could be a purchase, and it stretches you. It, 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 you know, some would call it irresponsible to a certain degree. Yep. Right? But you do it because it actually forces you to attain a new level. So what that is how it is for me so what does tactical stress mean to you yeah no that's a that's exactly it um it, it i feel like it does take a bit of clarity it takes a lot of clarity actually where you you know you can pull through but it's something you haven't done before hmm. where it, it's the same with like coaching where if you invest a lot of money in coaching and you know you have the ability to actually reach whatever de desired outcome is promised then you you usually do it. I've invested like four or 5,000 bucks in a coaching package and then I'll show up. This is bad practice, but I'll show up for like two calls and I'll, I'll already have done it. It's like all I needed was that little investment. And then I will I'll be like, I'm, I'm not going to show up to the rest of the calls. I already got it figured out. Sorry. Yeah. I did the exact same thing. I actually, well, I, I, I showed up and I paid money for this particular coaching call or this particular uh, coaching program. And what happened as a result was I got the three tactical things I needed out of it. So basically I spent an exorbitant amount of money to learn these three tactical things. But if I didn't invest into the coaching itself, then I wouldn't have got that shit done. You know, I wouldn't have actually done it. And it's, this actually goes with a lot of our clients too. They know exactly what they have to do, right? Uh, especially for us, we're not, I mean, I don't know about you know your coaching. I think your coaching could be a little bit different than mine. You're doing fitness coaching. You're doing like more. Uh, I, I know you do modern mastery, which is a lot more like on the business end of things, self development, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Am I am I correct or? 
Yeah, I'm I'm not doing much coaching myself oh, okay. right now. Okay. I'm 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 possibly doing a cohort in the future, but that's more like group coaching, walking gotcha. through curriculum okay. and stuff. Gotcha. Awesome. Uh so yeah, I, I just noticed that we already know what we have to do. Right. It's sometimes it's like you do the coaching to like force yourself to like fucking do it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's how I found with like a lot of my clients as well. Uh and then in regards to in regards to like uh the modern mastery what exactly does that mean to you? Because it's such a broad term, right? Yeah. And to oh, me, so the term modern mastery. Yeah, and, and also modern means like now, like 2022, yep. 21st century, right? Because it's very different. Exactly. You know, than what we were actually seeing before in the 21st or even the 20th century. So what does modern mastery mean to you? That it means mastering the modern world but again like what does that mean that means like what what are the new opportunities that people aren't taking advantage of that a few a select few are that is eventually going to be the main thing so why not get in early and that that encompasses a lot but it also encompasses like the personal development side of things so uh skill acquisition of modern tools like it's insane dude it's insane how like how the there is no barrier to whatever you want if you want to get jacked there is more than enough education online to do so if you want to make a ton of money there is ample education like you can do whatever you want for free online just by watching youtube videos and making that a habit. That's how I got like a coding job. That's how like I've done what I'm doing. It's like anyone can sign up for WordPress, build a website, start a Twitter account, make it look professional, post about what they're learning, build something and just teach what they're learning about, get direct feedback and like kind of accelerate personal growth that way as well. I've noticed that a lot is that me even if the money wasn't involved, starting on social media and just posting about what I'm learning yeah. helps me learn it faster and it shows my blind spots. Mm -hmm. It makes the unconscious conscious per se. And then I have something to improve and it's like I would have never known this if I didn't get it out of my head and either wrote about it or posted it online and you can write about it, but if you post it online, you're just opening yourself up to opportunities. Mm. So you got started on social media not so long ago i actually i think we got started almost at like the same time right mm -hmm. i think it was like two years ago i'm not i'm not sure what were you doing the wordpress stuff before that yes so okay. um i i tried a bunch of different things like i tried one of my main things was um digital art like photoshop art i was obsessed with photoshop art man like i would sit in my room for six hours at a time just like telling everybody like don't bother me like i'm listening to music i'm in this flow state i'm just making these weird uh compositions of pictures and then posting them on instagram and i was getting like a decent amount of traction because there were these huge uh like instagram photography pages where if you tag them and were posting consistently one of them may have gotten shared to an audience of 500,000 to like a million people. And so I gained maybe 1,000, 2,000 followers that way. But eventually I got burnt out. Like I couldn't keep sitting in my room for six hours a day, skipping class to make these uh, like art things. And I didn't know anything about monetization. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay, what can I try that will not only be creative, but allow me to make more money. And so it's like, oh, web design. So I started learning uh, WordPress and other like drag and drop template type deals. And then to aid in that in college, I took a basic HTML and CSS class. And then I, I took a few classes. It was pretty boring, wasn't getting it. And then one day I'm like, okay, this makes a lot of sense. Like I could build a website if I learned these few things. So I started... Again, curiosity is very important. This was me pursuing my curiosity outside of school. And I started taking all of these like Udemy courses for 10 bucks online. Um, 
And then I learned, I built out projects in those courses. And eventually down the road, I, I tried more and more business models like drop shipping. I think everyone tries that. Uh, I, I tried like other e-commerce stores. Like um, I, I ordered my own like minimalist wallets nice. and uh, tried selling those. I didn't sell any, but the wallets are cool. I have like five that I gave to my friends and they still use it. Uh, I tried an e-commerce store with blue light glasses. That was an utter failure, but I also have a bunch of blue light glasses, which is cool. And then um, after that, I, I realized like, okay, I'm not making money with this stuff. I am not probably not going to get a job in anything because I switched majors so many times. And so I started applying to web development jobs because I had studied that a lot. Like I had learned enough to be a front end developer. Uh, ended up getting a job at a web design agency and this was coding. This wasn't like WordPress or Elementor. And there, that's when things started to make sense because they were using templates to build out client websites for a specific audience. In this case, it was retailers like furniture, um, refrigerators, other things like that. They had a sales department, they had a marketing department and all of these other things. And so I'm like, like, how did I not realize that I need to learn, um, like marketing sales and like how to kind of productize my service to a point where I can take on more clients without doing a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And so that shot me down another rabbit hole. And so I'm like, oh, okay. WordPress and Elementor actually has some utility here. I created an offer that I thought would sell. I started cold emailing and quite literally walking into local businesses to try and land clients. I offered um, friends and family websites and I started to make that work. Um, it saw some success. I was making a decent amount of money on top of the job. And then what happened after that is like, oh, I could make this so much better by learning what an actual funnel is, right? Like maybe a tweet popped up or something where it's like, oh, a website doesn't convert customers that you use a website for this, not for making sales and, uh, people that are going to pay you big bucks. They want more money. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you need to study their customer acquisition process and kind of piece together your skill set in a way that will help them land more customers. And so I started building, uh, like small funnels for service-based businesses. It was pretty much a landing page, lead magnet, follow-up sequence to book an appointment. And so did that. That's when things started to take off. And I got a lot more responses. I got a lot more clients. Uh, I was able to charge more and take on like three to four clients at a time. So it was manageable. And so at this point, I'm like, okay, time to transition, quit my job. And that's when I started on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, I'm talking about web design, talking about some funnels. I'm talking about marketing. Uh, I created the web design course. I created the freelancing course. And then boom, <laughs> now we're here. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you were talking about web design and then now you have uh, evolved into yes. talking about self-improvement and everything that makes uh, a human being better. Number one, you missed the NFT uh, craze by like I did. this much. You yeah. Know, you, just, <laughs> you, just, you just made some, some apes just a little bit later, you know, just a little bit later, you would have crushed it. On, yep. on the graphic design front. But I feel like you're jumped into this thing that I, I feel is like the creator creator economy. And this is actually something that Nabal talks about a lot, uh, Nabal Ravikant, which is the sense that, you know, because of all these jobs that are going away, the, the people who will actually make it in this world are the people who actually are creating their own audiences right now. And the people who have mm -hmm. the blogs, the people who own, I don't want to say necessarily like own their own platforms, because if you're on Twitter, you don't own that platform, but you own your own audience and, and you are creating in a way where you are the brand itself. So what have you learned by making that transition? And also what have some of the lessons that you learned from uh, being on social media? Because right now I think on Twitter, you have like, like a hundred, almost like uh, pretty much like a hundred thousand followers close to that. On Instagram, you have pretty much, actually, we just talked about this, you're past 100,000 followers right now. What have you yep. learned about social media uh, in terms of like any uh, lessons, but uh, anything that's actually changed you over the course of time? 
it, it has opened my mind to everything. Like I, I didn't know that Naval had that. I, I, I've read Naval's threads and like studied him, but I didn't know that he was thinking of it as in terms of the creator economy because I wrote a blog post uh, maybe like two months ago about like my theory and views of the creator economy and how like creator kind of ties in with the philosophy and spirituality things like you are a creator in a sense by nature and the the thing that opened my mind based on also what i said previously about how like the whole intellectual development stuff and uh, freeing up room for creativity is that if everyone started to work towards this place or at least everyone that was skilled enough or saw this opportunity right now if they tried it, it's a self-sufficient like utopia of an economy like it and the the key here is that you have to pursue your own curiosity because that will take you in a direction that is incomparable to others right so you have and and people only a tr people think of the economy I mean, creator economy in the sense of like what they are currently aware of. Some people think of it as like, oh, this is only where you sell courses. Oh, this is only where you sell like freelance services. It's like, no, you, you have some people that are selling beef liver strips because they like beef liver so much. You have uh, like you could start an e-commerce store selling barefoot shoes if you're into like barefoot movement. You could really start anything in alignment with what you're truly curious about and what you are willing to dive down that rabbit hole or that iceberg and understand and pretty much dedicate your life's work to that because you love it so much and you can monetize it because you're an expert in that field and you know exactly how that specific thing that you're interested in provides utility to someone's life and you create a solution around that and you sell it and it's like the people could um like in, in the health side of Twitter, mm -hmm. it's like you have people that are very big on like regenerative farming. So it's like, okay, start your own regenerative farm, open your own shop as a creator, and boom, you're giving the people that are attracted to you the ability to buy fresh food from you, right? It's like butcher box, but it would be for a specific creator. And you could go into digital products, you can do whatever you want in this case. And so that's what it's opened my mind to is like we are kind of ahead of the curve not in like a bragging way but it's like we've we've only made these connections because we're deep into this and so that's the main discovery the other one is like just how conducive all of this is to personal growth it's like you are forced if, if you're not just copy pasting content you are kind of forced to understand and package up your thoughts in a way that not only provides utility or helps someone else make connections in their life and improve their life, but you're also like understanding your thoughts a lot better. It's a form of journaling to me, really, where I'm kind of journaling about my past experiences, what I went through right now, um, how, like, let's say I start talking about web design again. It's like, okay, what would I do differently? How can I help someone do this more streamlined and efficiently? Oh, I have something for you. you uh, okay, let me dive into this. So yeah. humans in general can process around 126 bits of information per second. It, some more, some less. The, what blows my mind and what I've realized is that courses or content or just education in general is not only becoming more decentralized, like it's open to anyone. If you can learn about it, you can teach it. But the information is becoming more condensed. We are allowing people to acquire skills at a much faster rate than we were previously able to. Like if, if you went to school for a design degree and it took four years, what if you could take a course that was systemized to the point where you learn everything you need to learn in order to get someone results in, let's say, a week? Like you can learn that and start executing on it in a week and it, it takes away all the fluff. I have my opinions on fluff. I actually like the fluff, yeah. but if it's very actionable, you are going to start either posting or creating or producing something of value. And that alone will teach you more about that skill set. 
rather than learning about it for four years. So we are not only being able to learn anything, we are all taking this knowledge, condensing it, making it more efficient and opening up room for better, more effective ideas as we talked about earlier. Yeah, this uh, reminds me of uh, a course that I just bought, which is uh, this course, I think it's called Big Feelings, Tiny People. And um, it's, uh, it's because my daughter had just turned two and you know how everyone talks about like the terrible twos, which I think is like complete bullshit because it really is just like people who aren't <laughs> able to understand their children and aren't able to handle them. If you're listening to this right now and uh, you disagree with me, then no, I stand by that. It is very much because you just don't know how to act. Um, so I bought this course. It's called Big Feelings Little Children. And... It is literally allowing me in a week time, in a week's time, to learn what I need to learn, which is actually some things that people would never fucking learn in the first place. To learn what I need to learn about how to raise a toddler in the in the best type of environment, within a span of about seven days, which would actually take parents probably the amount of time a toddler uh, grows out of her stage of being a toddler. You know, it would take them years. And what they're doing is they're condensing this information for me and they're allowing me to actually learn all this stuff. And then you, and I think I, I listened to this in the, in the podcast that you did with uh, our good friend, Danny Miranda, which you said, uh, you know, information is, uh, what is it called? Content is information. Courses are implementation. And I think you I think that was like from uh, this guy, Alex Ramosi as well. But when I took that course, just like the first freaking videos that i watched i implemented on my child and it worked like a freaking charm it was incredible <laughs> right it's just to, just to give you an example it's like you know when 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 people when toddlers turn two or when they become toddlers uh their prefrontal cortex has not has not uh, developed yet not like us you know we're able to control our emotions we're able to control our reactions to emotions but when kids go into tantrums, a lot of parents are like, yo, what the fuck? Why are you acting up, kid? You know? And then they get mad. They get pissed. <laughs> if I didn't yeah. have this course, I wouldn't have known that. And I would have looked at my daughter and be like, oh, man, like, please stop. But after this course, I realized that, number one, they don't have that much emotional control. And also, number two, this is how you deal with it. This is actually how you deal with the toddler. Uh, you, you get down to their level. Uh, you tell them that feelings are okay. As opposed to telling them not to, you know, do those feelings. You don't try to bribe them out of it. You let them go through their course, and you let them have those feelings. And the, here are some implement. Here are some things you can implement to allow them to uh, have control over their lives, which uh, which is something that they are craving so much. Uh, I, I love that. Now, now with this idea of like you know social media, uh, is there anything that you because you've talked about like the really good parts of it, right? Is there anything mm -hmm. that you see uh, yourself going into that would be constituted as somewhat of a negative? Because I feel like there's always like trade-offs to this thing. And I know there's trade-offs yes. every single fucking time. So in your, in your words and uh, in, in your kind of like perception, what do you feel are the trade-offs to being this creator on social media? Yes. The... This is why this is another reason why I think it's very conducive to personal growth is that you like the, the negative comments are going to come either way. Yeah. And it's like you have to be able to understand and navigate and shift your perspective to see their side and like understand that it and not take it personally. Yeah. And it's hard because they're attacking like your ideas or other things that you've taken time to understand and distill and hopefully like provide some form of value, right? Like I, I feel like I'm doing something good. And the, the, like when the negative comments pop up, it's hard not to focus only on that. Mm -hmm. Like all, all of the, the 99% of positive comments go out the window. Yeah. Once you see that negative one and you're like, oh my gosh, like you, you I've no, I've reacted many times where I start arguing with them and it's like, what am I doing? Yeah. And then that process has become shorter and shorter over time. Mm. Um, and then eventually you kind of just like stop paying attention, but it does get you, it gets you like, even if you think you are over the, 
negative comments. Mm. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is trying to, it's finding the balance between authenticity and value in a sense where it's like, yeah, I should be myself and I should be vulnerable and let everything out. But it's like, how much of my personal life do I actually want to tell some like a, a audience of a hundred thousand random people? Right. Cause you could talk about the Scott Adam. Was it Scott Adams? Yeah. It might've been Tim Ferriss. I think it was Tim Ferriss where he had a blog post where like someone tried to abduct him at an airport uh -huh. by like holding up his name and something like that, just because they knew he had a lot of money. They knew where he was traveling oh. because he posted about oh, it. No. They showed up at the airport and like, thankfully he was like, he noticed it. It's like, okay, that's, that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> but if he didn't notice it, it's like, what would have happened? So it's like, there are dangers because if I, let's say brag about a new monthly high mm. in business or at least not even brag, but just talk about it because you're supposed to, it's inspirational and other things. But it's like, what if someone that is not very stable sees that they see that I live in Texas, they piece together th some things from my Instagram story and they show up at my house and rob me. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah. that. So you have to be very careful. And then it's like you have the people that are like, oh, you need to you need to be vulnerable. You need to show like yourself. And it's like I there are a lot of bad things that could come from that. And I, I don't know. It's like, how do you how do you separate brand from self mm -hmm. while still having an impactful brand that is growing? <laughs> I do feel to I feel that to a very large degree. Uh, and I know that as you grow and, uh, do you have a girlfriend right now or are you, are you with I someone? Don't. Okay. Like when you, like, let's just even have a girlfriend or, you know, when you have a family, then the mm, stakes yeah. are a little bit higher, you know? And I do feel like with social media, it's like you, you choose what you want to share and that is okay. And, um, the entire sphere of whoever it is uh they don't have to be privy to that shit whatsoever they don't uh it is very much a choosing and actually i learned something from a couple of uh, my mentors uh, these guys are just uh, these guys actually have like massive audiences and you know just the top of the top of what they do something i notice about them is that they don't share nothing about their families at all yeah at all they only even post like pictures of their dads or whatever it is they, they keep that shit tight and they make like the content about the content you know and i think because we are kind of like starting out in this game a little bit and we are uh, we do want to share as much of ourselves as possible uh but then we also have to create these boundaries for ourselves too you know uh mm. yeah you know in regards to like the negative comment thing um yeah man like every single creator kind of like every single creator goes through that, that every single time even even people who don't put themselves out on social media you know and especially on social media that's the game that we're playing right now <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. you're you're basically opening yourself up to any and all and um and one of the things that's actually taught me is that it's actually taught me how to take the high road you know it's actually mm -hmm. taught me very yeah. much uh you know how to take the high road i'm still learning when to drop the asshole hammer and when to like you know relieve it a <laughs> <Yeah>. little bit <laughs> like i haven't really had much uh, instances where i felt like i needed to drop it but sometimes you just feel like you you just got to drop that asshole hammer a little bit and and just in general i do feel like negative comments on social media really teach you a lot about yourself and the way that you feel you know oh yeah, yeah man like uh i remember one time someone like commented uh on, my, on one of my twitter posts i think it was like a, a year ago or something like that i forgot and then i you know obviously you get the immediate jerk adrenaline action of just like ah yep and then <laughs> you're like hey wait uh why do i feel this way right and, and then you keep on asking and then i kept on asking myself well, why am i feeling this way it's not about them you know i knew this is the game i'm gonna play so what is it about then and then you just keep on digging and digging and digging and then it got and it got me to like a place where i'm like 
Oh, yeah, yeah. This is... Oh, the reason is is because I actually like being liked by people. I, I, I enjoy being liked by people. And that's not such a bad thing. It's actually got me to where I am. But it's also... Uh, the trade-off is is that when shit like this happens and people don't necessarily feel you, then, you know, that's what you're going to feel, right? And then it's actually mm -hmm. gotten me closer to this idea where I'm like, I don't fucking need to be liked by anybody, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, big lessons from... Actually, it's like, I feel like social media is like this one big... Uh, this one big testing ground of your frame a little bit and how mm -hmm. you actually approach this world. And... And yeah, man, if you if you actually if you actually see certain things about yourself, that actually is an indication of your frame, you know, and, and, and how you actually perceive the world in the first place. You know, so. Yeah. OK, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions here. I know that uh, we're actually getting close uh, to the time. I want to ask you some you know, kind of like a little bit of like rapid fire questions right now. So. I was going to ask you what your keystone habit is, but I think the, <laughs> I think walking <laughs> yep. is that already, you know, so I think we, we passed that already. Uh, if you could actually write down one question on your bedside and have the answer to it tomorrow morning, what would that be for you? Oh. Um, it would be. is oh man it, it would be is there meaning to it all or are we supposed to find meaning in the lack of meaning god damn that's a tough one right there too it's like it's it's very tough it, it's it, well it's it's so weird because like i i study it all the time and it's like i find little hints at like okay yeah this may be it and i go down that rabbit hole i find nothing and it's like i go down another one i find nothing and it's like i'm studying all these different cultures and philosophies and all of them are leading towards the same thing so it's like what's the pattern here and why is everyone doing the same thing and so why like why is there not just one why are people not realizing this what's so what are all the cultures leading towards whether it has meaning or not a notion of god okay and so and and then you get to the point where like it, it from let's say like Alan Watts, for example, one of his lectures that I've been listening to on repeat for probably a year trying to understand, not only because like Alan Watts is just a genius and his words are like poetry, like they kind of put you to sleep, but like there's something encoded in that message that I want to find. And maybe there isn't, maybe he's just talking nonsense, but it, the lecture is called like, you are God. And I'm like, mm. that's a, that's a contradiction. How? Mm. And so me trying to understand that and make sense of that, I haven't been able to. And so at this point, and then he's also mentioning, okay, surrender, let go, stop trying to know the unknowable. And it's like, okay, is it unknowable? And I, I get that. I've felt uh, the, like from surrendering or letting go and not trying to make sense of it, I've found like a lot of peace in that. I found a lot of like joy in the present moment as many spiritual teachers go after but then it's like it's the need to like figure that out it's like that that's what the mind does that's what the ego, ego does is it tries to make sense of things but if we don't make sense of things or have meaning then like i, I don't know that's something i think about every day <laughs> can we riff about this for a little bit I, yeah i would yeah. love to just have a chat about this i, I feel like um I had this concept uh, that I actually learned in this book. It's called The Master Key. I don't know if you've ever read that before. It's a, it's a PDF that you can find off of the internet. It was like the secret before the secret ever became. And I'm not saying I'm like this whole, you know, woo woo manifest and uh, universe guy, but <laughs> uh, it actually said that we are all uh, gods in the sense that we can actually create any reality that we see fit and also there is this passage in the bible that says that god is that we are created in the image of god and then when i think about that i think that well then if that's the case then god wouldn't create mediocre images of himself and he would all bestow right. upon us the power 
that he would have in regards to creation. So I feel that when it comes to like this unknowable, I do feel that we're uh, in this society that actually wants to have uh, a clear label on every single little thing that is out there and to put it in this box, in this neat little box and just say, hey, you are that or you are this, uh, you're from the left and you're from the right. Uh, and they, they basically want to label every single thing. And mm -hmm. I find that to a very large degree, stupid and irrelevant because yeah. when we try to label this shit and actually when we try to label things and try to explain things that cannot be explained, but we try to do it with our primitive monkey minds. We are actually doing a disservice to the, the miraculous things that happen in our lives on an everyday basis. And we're trying to put words to it when words cannot do these things justice in the first place. Right. So. Oh, that's. Yeah. That's a. That's big. I, I didn't make that connection before. We're like, we are doing it a disservice, whatever it is that we are trying to simplify. Mm -hmm. And. One other thing that I've kind of connected is that like all understanding is metaphorical, right? Like the, the notion of God or whatever, as Alan Watts puts it, um, like if you have five, let's say explorers or like five people that are trying to map things out, if you put them at a bottom of a mountain and you say, okay, draw a map to get to the top they're all going to come up with different ways of getting there. Mm. Right. And then in terms of all understanding being metaphorical or story based, like one thing having to come before another one thing, having to come after that, uh, everything's being layers of story. Like I am Dan Co. And because of the story I've lived out, it's the label I've been given, mm. uh, that like my hand wouldn't make sense if it wasn't attached to a forearm. Like a cloud wouldn't be a cloud if humans weren't there to call it a cloud. And the other thing with that is if everything, if every single thing is just a label or a metaphor, what we are trying to describe that is unknowable is just that. It's a metaphor that we're trying to understand with what we have in our head. And a lot of the times that may not be possible. That may be impossible because it's just that it's a metaphor. It's not like, we're not describing as Alan Watts says what it is. We're describing what it's like. And so we have to experience that on a personal level, like direct experience. And then we can either try to explain it or we can just understand like, yes, we have reached this state of internal understanding and it cannot be understood with one of our senses, which is audio. And uh, when we give these, when we try to explain these things, that actually gives us comfort for our minds, for our thoughts. Right. It's like, oh, well, you know, I can put this here, and I can feel comfortable with it. And there is, and I, there is something to be said about the fact that, hey, thinking has actually got us this far, and that's there's no good or bad. Like thinking is thinking, whatever it is, conscious thought. But there is power in turning off your brain. And allowing, let's just say, God, energy, the universe to go off and do its thing. And for you to react in such a way without actually giving mm -hmm. it thought, without actually doing it. I actually have this thing where I try to tell uh, my clients, I'm like, stop fucking over trying. Like, stop fucking trying. <laughs> you know, like, the more yep. you try, the harder it's going to be. And that's so counterintuitive yep. for them. Right? It is. It is it's the it's the law of reversed effort yes and and it, it dude it works for everything yeah. but it, like the the thing is is you can't you like you can't understand it until you do it but you can't force it either you can't try to not try yeah. it's just a matter of like that's it like just stop <laughs> it's like use thought to uh maybe to a certain extent but at some point, you got to turn that off and you got to let the instincts fly wherever they are. Yep. So 
Uh, last question for you. Who are your heroes in life? My heroes. Oh man. Uh, so I, I would say my parents yeah. and I, I didn't think that before. It took a lot of like development to get to this point because as a kid, like I, I honestly not despise, but it's like, I, I observed, I observed and it's like, okay, I don't really want this life for myself. Right. And I didn't really agree with the things they were telling me because I was so avid in like researching and finding the best answer for whatever I could. And so when they would give me advice to do something, it's like, I already know how to do that. Like that's bad advice. I would write things off. I'd rebel. I'd like, I, I didn't like them taking me to church. I didn't like them like forcing me to do, uh, not forcing, but like putting me in, let's say basketball or sports or other things because it wasn't something that I was, I wanted to do. And so now like there was a bit of resentment there that I had to overcome and understand and see their perspective. And, um, that was the main thing. And so I've, I've started to, the relationship never really died. Yeah. The, it, it was just like, I, there was that resentment there. And so now I'm working to, uh, talk to them more, um, like develop and cultivate that relationship without, uh, reacting in a sense because it's like you go home from the holidays we're completely different people the entire family's there they're discussing politics like it's just argument ensues and it's like okay how it's like th this these aren't bad people like at all and I, like i love these people for them raising me and putting up with my <laughs> putting up with me like me being a dick to them <laughs> and so it's like i i have to take a step back and see how i can uh like make the most of these situations. And I, I mean, they're your parents. Like I can't, I can't thank them enough for just, I wouldn't be here without them. Like that, it's as simple as that. And I'm not even talking about just birth. I'm talking about like my entire life direction w is based off of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And there is something there that I need to pay back in a sense. Yeah. And I'm glad you got there before having kids. <laughs> Yeah, it's like mm. when you have kids, that's when you really real. That's when you realize that oh my god, like, <laughs> <laughs> like what the, wow, I was such a dick to my parents. Uh, yep. But in general, um, right now, you're doing modern mastery. Uh, where can people find you? Yes, uh, at the Danco on anything, or just Danco on like YouTube or something. Yeah. You can find me. Yeah. Uh, but then, yeah, Modern Mastery is the community. It's on my profile. But, yeah, if you want to find me, you'll find me. Uh, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Dan, I really enjoyed this conversation. I uh, really uh, respect and uh, appreciate you as a friend. And, uh, yeah, really, really do uh, think that we had this uh, really good conversation, especially especially those parts around God. And I do think uh, maybe the next time that we do this is to tease a little bit more out of you in regards to that but uh but thanks nah. for coming on i really do appreciate it and if you guys uh want to check out dan go to the dan co i believe that's uh your social media handle on both instagram and twitter uh is there any yes. projects that you're working on right now that uh that you want to you know keep us uh keep our eyes out for um yes the the cohort digital economics it's pretty much like it's it's my version of what I talked about earlier, where it's like condensed information, getting people up to speed, building real world projects, and kind of taking advantage of the creator economy. So like learning all of the things that it takes to get there and learning the skills like storytelling, but but from a philosophical perspective, like that's what I really like. And that's what made me understand it. Uh, so that's the main thing, dude, I really appreciate you having me on. This was a, a crazy conversation <laughs> and I'm more than open to do another one to dive deeper into the, yeah. the meaning and God rabbit hole. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. Uh, yeah, man. So you guys, uh, want, keep an eye out for, it's called the digital economy is what you said. Uh, digital economics, digital economics. Awesome. Awesome. And Dan, thanks again for jumping on. Really appreciate you, man. Appreciate you too, man. <laughs>